Last year uh, on this podium in a different hotel, but at the same conference, I talked about why you should uh, keep calm and buy gold stocks. And if you remember, the S&P was uh, starting to peel off a bit. The Dow Jones was having seven or 800 point down days. Um, and it was starting to get, to get exciting from a fear perspective for gold. And I talked about that. And so this year, um, I figured I would just update that talk. And instead of tell, telling you to keep calm and buy gold stocks, I'm going to tell you to uh, stay calm and buy quality gold stocks. Uh, for a bit different reasons. So let's do some juxtaposition. I'll cover quickly what we talked about last year or what I talked about last year and then sort of what's changed since. Um, well, what's changed? My beard is a little bit longer. It's got a few more gray hairs. I don't know if that's because of junior performance or having three kids in three years, but for one reason or the other, my beard is turning gray very, very quickly. And so last year, keep calm. This year, stay calm. Uh, last year, I talked about why gold was so cheap. Um, we were in a, a record bull market for, for broad-based equities, and we're back there now, really, with the S&P at, at, at 3,000 and the Dow at, at 27,000. And so when you have a record bull market, nobody is fearful. Nobody needs a hedge. Nobody wants gold. Everybody had forgotten about gold. Uh, rates were rising at the time, uh, right? And the Fed was projecting that rates would continue to rise, and we know that that hasn't quite played out. Uh, we had the pet rock stuff going on where you had the analysts and the commentators on MSNBC talking about how, you know, they don't need gold. Gold isn't a hedge. Um, it's a pet rock, et cetera. Um, and we just had a general lack of systemic risk uh, a year ago. The stocks were at all-time highs. Volatility was at lows. Um, and gold was just starting to respond to a fear trade. And I said last year that... Um, you know, the money flows just weren't there. There wasn't any money flowing into gold, institutional money, private equity money, how we needed new discoveries and how um, the central banks were just starting to buy. So let's flash forward. Or let's talk about where we were last year, actually. This is the chart I put up, and I said the orange line is gold stocks and the blue line is uranium. And gold stocks last year for the year were doing even worse than uranium. It was not a good feeling in the bottom of your gut if you're an investor in either of those sectors because they had been absolutely demolished. Gold at this time down last year was down 25%. But um, and you had these are the people I was talking about on MSNBC. I don't know if you folks are Twitter folks. I'm a I'm a Twitter addict. And so there's a, a gentleman in, named Downtown Josh Brown, the reform broker who hosts a show on MSNBC. And he says we don't need any gold. We don't need that stinking gold because it doesn't diversify and it doesn't hedge. And if you look at the date, he probably would want to take that tweet back, September 5th, 2018, right? And you even had gold bugs saying last year at the time, I put this slide up and said, uh, Max Kaiser was a huge gold bug. Now he's a crypto bug, but he was saying, um, and, and with the guy from Men in Black, Will Smith saying, does anyone remember gold? It's completely erased from our memories, right? Don't even worry about it. Gold's forgotten. But what a difference a year makes, right? So here's the updated chart from this year. The black line is gold, up 20% from last year's conference. And then you just got the GDX, the GDXJ, and the, and the, gold, box in, the gold bugs index there up anywhere from uh, 30 to 45%. And we're starting to feel pretty good this year, right? What a difference a year makes. But then what a difference two years makes. What's going on there? The, the equities aren't outperforming gold in a two-year span. They're just sort of right in line with it. What the heck is going on? These things are supposed to be leveraged to the price of gold. They're supposed to go up higher than the gold price, right? Why aren't the, the equities going up higher than the, than the gold price in the past two years? Oh my goodness, what a difference three years makes. Gold is outperforming the equities. Why? Why aren't the equities going up higher than the gold price? And this is where we start not to feel really good, right? Because now the equities are starting to go back down. What is happening? Um, and then this is the classic newsletter writer chart, right? I had a couple people email me in the last week saying, hey, some stocks are doing pretty good. How do you feel about that? One in particular is a company called Millrock Resources that I financed at. 30 cents and I financed it seven and a half cents and it went to 17 cents last week because the CEO um, struck a deal with an Australian company to put 20 million dollars in one of his projects for 60% uh, of it and the stock went from seven cents to 17 or 18 cents last week a double right and I got people emailing me CEOs saying you still doing Millrock that thing's doing pretty good and I email them back this chart and say come on man I financed Millrock at 30 cents 17 cents doesn't feel good let's stop the self-congratulations in the sector it's not time yet right 
So the stocks that are doing well, we talked about them a bit on the panel this morning if you were here, but they're the big ones that everyone knows, right? The ones that are generating cash flow, the ones that have active and operating mines. I'm talking about the Kirkland Lakes and the Anglo Gold Ashantis and the Sabanyes, which we talked about this morning on the panel, and Agnico Eagle and Barrick. They've done quite well. Look, in the past year, up 40 to 150 percent, and and those have really been the, the only equities to, to move. Um, because the juniors, they haven't moved so much. So no disrespect to Cambridge or any companies, but I just went alphabetically and picked the four first companies on the, on the exhibitors list uh, alphabetically and put them into a chart. And over the past year, this is sort of where we are. And it's not just to single out those companies. That was just alphabetical. But junior equities I've been invested in. Somebody asked me this morning about Midas Gold and Revival Gold down 45 or 50 percent for the year. And, and, and that's the reality. It's the mid-tiers and the majors are moving and the, and the juniors are not. And so that's sort of the, the, the stage for the equities. I want to talk about why the stage is set for those juniors to finally catch back up. So this is what happened late last week. The, the deficit is back up to um, $984 million. The deficit that is really easy to erase, according to Trump, and he can get rid of in eight months is now at $984 billion and, and, and creeping up very, very fast there. Um, and last year we were talking about um, how the Fed was starting to raise interest rates. But here I want to talk about interest uh, payments on the debt. And look how fast they are climbing. Um, in the next couple of years, they're going to have uh, the payments on the, on the debt, the interest payments on the debt are going to outpace our, our spending on defense. And if you know anything about our defense spending, it's several, several, several times the next largest country in the world. And you know, you see it right there, $600 billion a year or whatever. Just the interest payments on that debt are going to surpass our spending on aircraft carriers and stuff like that. And so um, if you just stew on that for a moment, it's kind of it's crazy to think about. And then you wonder why the, the central banks want lower, lower interest rates, right? And here's those lower interest rates. Um, going back to 2017 or 2018, the Fed was saying during this time in 2019 that rates are going to be rising. Well, they were completely off base. Um, they've cut recently. They're likely going to cut again in, in, in next week. I think there's like a 93% probability if you poll people who pay attention to these things. And you have large economies like the strongest economy in Europe, Germany, and, and then Japan in negative territory and, and seemingly not able to raise now, people talking about global recessions and things like that. And so this is really the last tool that the Fed has left to, to combat this kind of stuff. And I don't know about you, but I like my GDP to be bigger than my, than my debt. But that's not what's going on here. You have a, you have a debt to GDP ratio that's over 100 um, percent, which means the debt that you owe is larger than everything your economy makes combined. And so all these, I'm just setting the stage for you as the fundamental reasons why gold has to rise and why juniors are going to rise with them. I'll get there in a second. Oh, and here's the central bank demand for gold. What do they know? I mean, what do they know that they started buying gold in, in, in record amounts starting in, uh, call it a bottom there, in 2017, 2018, all the way up to the most gold they've ever bought since Nixon took us off the gold standard last year. So these central banks know something. They want the rates to be low, and they want to own gold. It's like, well, just don't think. Look, as Mr. Dines would say, right? He says, just look at what's going on. The central banks want to own gold. Why wouldn't you want to own gold? This is what they're doing. Now let's look at gold back ETFs and the gold that they've been holding. I like this chart because I like cycles a lot. And I think the cycle is very much coming back. You look at the last one in 2010 and 2011 and the amount of uh, gold that ETFs had in their holdings then. And we're just about to, to prick right back to, the, to that. And if you know anything about technical analysis, which I am not, but I talk to people, um, you know, that could, that could ramp up very, very fast just based on that chart. And then you've probably seen some version of this chart. That was all macro stuff, fund rates, interest rates, um, holdings, central bank buying. This is actual gold. So um, the red lines are gold that we discovered by year, and the blue lines is the amount of money we spent to find it. And so you'll see that last year um, we spent much, much, much more money than in 1995, but we only found... 5% of the gold that we found in 1995 last year, despite spending um, twice as much to find it. And the gold that was found, the 5% of the gold that we found in 1995, it was half the grade of the gold we found in 1995. So we're finding much, much less gold, um, and it's uh, much, much lower quality. 
And so if we think about the companies that did well from the, from the earlier slide, the Agnicos and the Sabanes, these guys that are producing, well, they're producing ore, right? They're going through the reserves. At some point, they're going to have to take that cash flow that they're generating now, and they've got to replace those reserves. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. And that's really what's going to be, I think, a catalyst for these quality juniors that have outlined quality resources. Let's talk about the, the, the big money, the smart money coming back into gold. Um, last year, I told you that the previous year, which would have been 2017, there was something like $700 billion of, of private equity money invested, and only $2.3 billion of those dollars went into mining. And that actually fell last year again, all the way down to $2 billion. And if you back out coal, it's only $1 billion, because half that money went into coal, as you can see on the chart there. $1.1 billion went into coal. So $531 million of private equity money went into uh, gold and investing last year. Now that was um, actually twice the 2017 levels. So although the overall money in private equity went down that was invested into mining, the private equity money that went into gold from year to year from 2017 to 2018 actually doubled. So this smart money is starting to come back into the space. Last year, I gave you this quote from Agnico Eagle's Sean Boyd, and he was saying, there's just too few high quality opportunities left and far too many players. And if you remember at this time last year, it was sort of Barrick Rangold time. And then a few months later, it was, it was Newmont time for, for major, major acquisitions. And there, there have been a couple since. And so that's really a catalyst for more deals because they've said publicly they're gonna shed a lot of assets. So some of those assets are gonna be bought by other companies. And in a very real way, um, the Agnico Eagles, uh, Agnico, Agnico Eagles of the world are going to have to to step up and, and start buying companies to uh, replace the reserves, and that's exactly what their leader um, is saying. So I told you that quote last year, and here's what's happened since. Gold transactions increased 82% last year from $6.4 billion in 2017 to $11.7 billion in 2018. So he was very much right. The amount of gold transactions is going up at a, at a very fast pace. And not only is the uh, amount of transactions going up um, in absolute terms, but the deal value is going up as well. So the average deal rose to uh, 134% from 2017 to 2018. So deals are getting bigger and more frequent. Um, but they're still only buying from the producers currently. Four times more gold was bought from producers um, than non-producers. Gold in the ground, 104 million ounces from producers versus only 28 million ounces from juniors or developers. And so they haven't gone all the way down the value chain yet, but that's what happens, right? We're gonna start getting to the juniors with quality assets. Let's talk about the price for a second. The price of those deals was something like $90 per ounce of gold on average. That's the, the yellow line there. And so you just think about that for a second. I was leading a walking tour earlier and we went to Gold Mining's booth and he was saying that his uh, Amir Anani's 22 million ounces, whatever it is, 22.9 million ounces of resources is only trading for $15 an ounce. And you got the average takeout price at $90 an ounce. So think about that multiple there. That's sort of the opportunity, right? 90 divided by 15. That's the amount of multiples that we're looking at with these, with these quality gold, gold stocks and gold companies that have, that have resources. And I look at others like, I don't know, a company I talked about last year was Revival Gold. They have 3 million ounces of gold in trade at a, at a, at a $25 million market cap. So what is that, like 8 or $9 an ounce? I mean, the valuations are pretty, are pretty silly when, when companies are getting taken out for $90 an ounce. So that, implies a, that implies a 10 times return, right? I mean, it's getting pretty crazy. And so I'll talk about companies for the last five minutes. Um, and if we have time, I'll take a, a few questions. But some that I recommend and, and own personally, I talked about a few of them this morning. One is Taranga Gold. It's a half a billion dollar company. Um, Going to produce about 250 to 290,000 ounces this year. And it's bringing on a new mine called Wagnion that's, that's in Burkina Faso that's ramping up this quarter and will be in full production next year. It will take them to a 300 to 350,000 ounce producer, which is firmly in mid-tier mid, mid territory, all in sustaining costs around $800. 
an ounce, and that's their second mine. So they have an operating mine in Senegal, this new mine, second mine online in Burkina Faso, and then they have a very, very prospective land package called Golden Hills also in Burkina Faso, on which they're currently doing 27,000 meters of drilling that we'll have news flow on over the coming uh, months. And so some catalyst there for Taranga Gold. And this is sort of high level stuff and I'll get smaller as I go. Another company I've been supportive of for a long time and, and have invested money in and recommended is Midas Gold. And it's the seventh largest gold reserve in the US. And that's if you include active mines like Barrick and Newmont. Midas has the seventh largest reserve and the fourth highest grade. It's an absolutely massive project. I've been there. There's six million ounces on the book. If you talk to anybody who knows about the project, there are many more ounces there. They're currently going through permitting. And so they didn't want to, you know, find 10 million ounces and have to permit 10 million ounces. It's much easier to permit 6 million ounces. We're expecting a, a final um, EIS and record of decision in, in Q4 of next year. So it's fast exiting the, the permitting stage and, and, and fast getting close to um, that exciting stage of the curve. I'm sure you've seen the, the Brent Cook chart about the, the cycles of mining stocks and when they're boring and when they're exciting. Midas is about to get really exciting again. And, and if you just look at the numbers, right? So um, on their PFS, I believe it was, which is outdated now from 2014, because they've been trying to get this thing permitted now for a while. They're ready to go. At $1,350 gold, it's an NPV post-tax of $832 million. And yet the stock is trading at $150 million Canadian. Call it whatever, $100, $110 million US. To the $832 million at present value that it's worth. Um, after taxes. And there's a, there's a bunch of, of, of superlatives I could label on Midas, whether it's um, the big stake that, that John Paulson's company has taken in the, the, uh, the, the company early on and maintained. The same thing with Barrick, 19.9% of um, Midas. Franco Nevada came in really early. It was the earliest uh, royalty they'd ever bought on any project. They came into Midas very early and took a, took a royalty on it. Um, tech owns some. Um, just a very high quality project that's very close to getting permitted. And the U.S. government wants it, per wants it permitted, right? Not only uh, because Trump has, has eased the or greased the wheels of, of permitting the United States, but because there's a large um, antimony component, which is a critical mineral, and uh, used as a flame retardant, uh, and the U.S. produces none of it. It all comes from China primarily, so it brings a critical uh, element uh, into production in the United States. And also... So the, the ore in Midas is, is very interesting. It, it contains a lot of sulfur. And so um, it's the reason that I think Barrick has invested 20% because they need sulfuric ore in their operations in Nevada um, because they use the sulfuric acid as, from a byproduct to help leach the ore in their operations. And they're running out of sulfuric ore in Nevada. So I think it's a strategic play for Barrick to get that. Um, or from Midas, truck it down from, if you look on a map, Idaho, it's right on top of Nevada, and truck it down to their Nevada operations so Midas wouldn't even have to um, process the ore, potentially. Uh, the last thing I'll say about Midas before I get into this company is it's a super fun site. Uh, it provided like all the tungsten for World War One and World War Two, and they just sort of left it there. Um, there's a, a, a salmon spawning creek that's been shut down since the 1940s that the salmon can't even get up to, and Midas is gonna is gonna green all this up as part of their as part of their mine development plan. They're gonna remediate the entire thing, and so the government certainly wants that because the government doesn't want to spend a billion dollars doing it. Um, and then the last company, I got the yellow light, so um, I'll, I'll talk about Almaden very quickly. This is a, a stock that went to $5 in 2011 when it made its Extaca discovery in Mexico. Um, and it's since gone from $5 to $0.75 cents as they continue to develop it and add ounces. They have 4 million ounces in the ground, evenly split between gold and silver, expecting a permitting decision by the end of the year. They bought a mill already worth about $70 million. They bought it for, for $10 million, seven to $10 million. And so they're very confident that they're gonna develop this project. Um, stock is currently at a $73 million market cap versus its 
um, projected NPV of 310 million. So again, the juxtaposition of those numbers there. Almaden, very high quality company, uh, well run, has treated shareholders very well, has spun out assets over the years um, to give you multiple shares of other companies, Azucar now and Almadex. And so uh, just a quality company to be involved with as they approach a, a final decision in permitting. And so I'll leave you with another Sean Boyd quote before I go. Last year he said that there was too few um, projects and too many players chasing them. And this is his quote from a press release just last week, so I thought it was fitting to leave with that. He says, we're going to make a stronger case on the benefits of resource development, whether it's in speeches, whether it's in media we do, or in advertising campaigns we do. It's time Canadian companies stand up and say, look, mining and energy is not all bad. And so if you take a step back and you compare his quote from last year to this year, you can sort of see the evolution of the cycle as well. Last year he's saying it's time for consolidation. And this year he's saying it's time to get out and pound the table and tell everybody why mining stocks are good and so i think that's just very indicative of where we are hopefully the juniors catch up soon